Hi, everybody. Welcome to the first of several alumni panels that we are hosting this month. Thanks so much for joining us. We have a couple more folks coming in from the waiting room. So we will get started in just a couple of minutes. This is a meeting format, not webinar. So if you would like to um, have your video on, you are more than welcome. We'd be um, happy to see your faces, but if you are more comfortable with your video off, that's great too. We're just happy to have you here um, to learn a little bit about our alumni, and what they're up to these days, and hopefully be able to provide you with some great advice um, and answer questions. When we do this in person, we usually have some food, some coffee, uh, chocolate, tea. It's fairly informal. We can sit around a table together and chat. So I'm hoping that you have the same experience here. Definitely want you to feel comfortable asking any questions um, of our guests. They um, are really excited to share with you. And they also know how kind of rare this opportunity is when you get to actually pick the brain of someone that has been in your shoes not that long ago and um, can give you some of those, I wish I only knew tidbits. Um, it's really just golden for folks. So let me just check the waiting room real quick. And it looks like we're all in. So I'm just gonna go ahead and get started. So again, welcome everybody. I'm Janine Perez. I am the director of the Student Success Center here in the College of Education. Really excited to have you join us for the first of several alumni events that we're having over the next few weeks. I am joined by Dani Umana, who is one of our student ambassadors. She is a current uh, communicative disorders and sciences major and has been really instrumental in helping coordinate these panels that are coming up for you. So I just wanted to go over a couple of housekeeping things. We are recording this event. I know a lot of folks um, are in class right now or working, and this isn't a convenient time. So a recording is going to be available on our YouTube channel if you wanted to share with your friends. Um, as I said, we are really hoping this is a comfortable, informal opportunity for you to chat with our alumni. We'd love for you to ask questions. And you can do that by using a couple of different features. Down below on your chat box, feel free to type in any questions that you might have for our panelists. You can also unmute, you could use the raise hand function. If you click on the participants window down at the bottom, there's a little option to raise your hand and we can um, have you unmute and ask your questions directly. So we'll do that for a little bit. Um, and then at the end of the presentation, please stay tuned because we're gonna have some details about upcoming events um, that we have planned for you all throughout April and May. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen and hand the mic over to Danny to get us started. Hi everyone, we're so glad you can make it today. Um, we're really excited for you to get to know our panelists. Um, I'm gonna have them each talk a little bit about themselves. Um, Lily is an elementary school teacher who came through the CHAD program here at Leary College. Um, she came back also for her credential in teaching. Um, Nicole is a counselor of education in Piedmont Hills High School. She was also a former alumna here. So we're so excited to hear about each of them. Um, I don't know if either of you would like to go first and just kind of share a little bit about your journey. Yeah, sure, I can share. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nicole Ellis, and I graduated from the Counselor Education Program in December 2019. And um, I did my undergrad at UC Davis, and I majored in psychology there. And um, when I was in the EDCO program, our counselor education program at San Jose State, I did a variety of different internships, um, one at a middle school and then two at the high school level, which really helped me to gain the experience 
that I was going to need to get my school counseling credential and also just to get a lot of mentorship and hands on experience that really helped me when I was going to job interview for roles for school counselor roles towards the end of grad school. And right now I work at Piedmont Hills High School as a high school counselor. And I really enjoy it so far. I've been there for a little bit over a year. So I started there in January of 2020, about a month and a half before shelter in place started. So it's been a wild journey, but I'm enjoying it a lot and being able to connect with all the staff and students and families, um, even in the virtual format. It's it's been a, a really good experience and I'm learning a lot and I'm really excited to just share more about my undergrad and grad school experience and my experience as a school counselor. Thank you for having me. All right, and uh, my name is Lily Soto. Uh, a little bit about me. I was born and raised here in San Jose uh, and I went to San Jose City College and then San Jose State where I got my um, bachelor's in childhood and adolescent development. And then I came back right after <laughs> to do my multiple subject credential and master's. Um, and I graduated in the same um, December of 2019. After that, I was subbing. I planned, oh, I was going to, you know, think <laughs> to myself, I was like, okay, I'll sub for half of the year and then I'll get hired on as a teacher, um, which it did end up happening, but the subbing got cut short due to COVID. Um, and so the rest of that time I was job hunting, which was a very interesting experience. I'm glad to have gotten hired. I'm currently a first grade teacher at Maddox Elementary, which is in the Milpitas Unified School District. Um, this year has been very interesting to say the least, but I feel like I've gotten to use like a lot of the skills that I learned in my, especially in the master's program with like reflecting on your teaching um, and I guess like being intentional. Um, so, yeah, it's been an interesting past year and a half, but I'm really glad to be here and to share my experiences as well. Well, thank you both so much for sharing. I feel like your journeys are so special and I think probably relatable to most of us here today. Um, did anyone want to start off on some questions for our panelists? All right, then I'll go ahead and start with one of mine. Um, sorry, just lost it for a second. All right, what inspires you to work in your field? And how did you find the right fit for your values and interests? I would say for me, um, being able to support students and advocate for them is really huge for me. And especially uh, when I was an undergrad, I started to develop a passion for social justice in particular. And that was through the research I was doing at Davis and through my minor, which was women's studies. And so I started to really value that. And additionally, when I was an undergrad, I did an internship abroad where I got to work with high school students in Japan. And so I think that, you know, social justice paired with wanting to help others, being a psychology major, and then also being able to work in education and being able to um, advocate for students, be there for them, support them in that role. So all those things kind of come together for me, which is why I picked school counseling and why um, I'm just, I'm grateful to be in a field where I feel like it's very rewarding and meaningful work. And I feel like I do get to be there for students, um, support them in different ways, um, and be a part of their high school experience, high school journey. Yeah, I think similar to Nicole, being like part of that support system is something that definitely intrigued me. Um, well, my major originally was in child development, so um, I knew that I wanted to go into teaching. Um, I grew up, my mom's a preschool teacher, she still is. And so I guess maybe kind of being exposed to that, but then realizing through different jobs, I worked at summer camps and I just really enjoyed um, being with children and making those connections. And I think that that's like the big part, making connections with students is something that has been really meaningful this year, especially when you know, you're not making as many connections as you did before. Um, so 
Um, being able to create that like little community within the classroom has been really rewarding and something that I've enjoyed being able to do. Um, I'm not sure if there's any other parts of the question that I missed, but those are some of my thoughts. Thank you. I feel like that was beautiful. Um, I'm also very passionate about advocacy. Um, and I think that education is the perfect fit for that. Um, yeah, I think it's incredible that both of you have had so much of your experience be in a virtual setting. Um, it, I'm sure it's nothing that any of us could have anticipated or expected at all. Um, because I know, especially for teachers, the feedback that I've heard so often is that, you know, you didn't go into it to teach virtually or to teach from a screen, right? Um, would you have any advice for people who are in Chad right now and unsure about what their future profession will look like? Yeah, I would say this year, like I said, has definitely been interesting. I don't know, since me, this is my first year in teaching. I'm just kind of like, okay, I'll be flexible. And honestly, I've gotten really used to this format. So I think um, like I just came back, I have like a hybrid model now at my school um, where we're having like a few students come into the classroom and I'm like remembering all those things that I just like hadn't thought of in so long because um, you know, like anything like partner talk is not an easy task to do online or you can't do it on the fly like you could in the classroom. Um, so that has taken some adapting and I think, um, I don't know, being flexible is really important. I mean, I'm sure your first year in your career, no matter um, what career you're going into, but uh, I feel like I especially learned that this year, like, um, uh, and, and not, and not um, what's the word? Like feeling too down on yourself if you don't meet your own expectations. Like, um, I think that that has been really helpful for me this year. Like setting the, the correct amount of expectations for myself. Um, I don't know, those are some things that I think. Yeah, I think for me as well, I agree with a lot of what Lily said about being flexible and definitely adaptable, um, starting the career, my career as a school counselor, and then also starting in a district and at a school that I never worked be at before, and then, you know, not necessarily being like right next to my coworkers or being on campus to see students in person and then finding ways to still get the support um, to be successful in the role. And then also still finding systems and ways to connect with students, even in a virtual setting. I think those have been like definitely challenges for me um, and just, Setting, I would say for me, just setting work boundaries too. Um, you know, sometimes with the virtual setting, I feel like it can kind of be hard because there's not necessarily that like transition when you're like driving from the school to home. And so sometimes it's like those, those lines are blurred a little bit. So for me, it's been really about like, as I'm learning the job and at times there's a lot to learn and there's a lot of students to support and um, just setting those work boundaries for me um, has been super important <laughs> and it's been challenging, but, you know, having like a cutoff time for when I stop responding to emails and stop working on things um, and just, you know, sticking to those boundaries so that I'm not getting like very burnt out and overwhelmed. So, um, and then just finding systems, like I mentioned before, of how to provide support to students, even though like a lot of them have never met me before in person. Um, and same with the parents and the families a lot. Um, unfortunately, I didn't get to meet in person before shelter in place started. Um, so for me, I've been trying to develop a way to provide drop in counseling office hours each week for parents and guardians and also each week for the students so that they could at least drop in and, you know, see, see a face and ask any questions. So I'm trying to kind of develop my own systems to connect um, with the students and build those relationships still. Yeah, adding on to what Nicole was saying, I think that really resonated with me about um, the work-life uh, balance, I don't know, and boundaries. Um, personally, for me, since um, I had a classroom, 
um, and they allowed us to. I, I've been going in pretty regularly, although it still is difficult. Like your first year, you want to like give it your all. And I feel like, I don't know, that's, I don't know, a teacher mentality, but also like, I don't know, anyone who works to support um, like children and families, it's a very like um, intense or like, uh, I don't know, it takes a lot out of you. And um, it's important to set those boundaries for yourself. I feel like in the first half of the year, especially being a first year teacher, that was really hard because I don't have anything to go off of. Like I remember working with my CTs and they would have these like um, um, file cabinets full of material. And like, here I am starting, you know, my first year with like what I have um, and what my team can support me with. So that was very difficult um, for me, but now I've kind of like, towards the second half of the year felt a little bit more comfortable. I try, you know, when I go home, not to do work anymore, <laughs> which is hard, but um, you know, the weeks will continue coming and they'll continue being work. Um, if you do it after work or if you do it, you know, at school. So um, that's definitely an important thing that I've learned this year, especially being online. Thank you. I appreciate how you both incorporated um, your the way that you balance, um, you know, working in a virtual setting and still having time for yourself and to take space because, like you said, it can be really tough trying to meet the needs of the kids and of the families that you want to do it. That's what you came in here for, right? Um, but there's also, you know, we can't give from an empty cup. So I agree, it's very important to take time for yourself and to set good boundaries. I feel like as students, we can also take note of that even now. Um, another question that I had um, was about your undergrad experience or well, your master's experience too, right? Um, how did they contribute to your skills as a professional? Um, did you do any extracurricular activities or find any mentors that were particularly significant to you? Yeah, um, for me, when I was an undergrad, I was involved in some different organizations and clubs on campus. So I was um, in a club for my major. It was the Undergrad Psychology Association. And then in the second, I was a transfer student. So and after my first year at Davis, um, being in the club for a year, I then took on um, a leadership role within the club and was one of the club officers. So I would help with like coordinating the different events we had and meetings we had. And then I also um, got a job as a research assistant on campus in a lab that focused on social psychology research. And that was a great experience because um, I was introduced to my mentor through that program or through the through working in the research lab. And she was a PhD student doing her research on um, specifically on racism and how it impacts Asian Americans. And so I got to be a part of that study and meet other undergrad students through it too. And then um, really got to talk to her a lot about like, you know, grad school, what, what I want to do after undergrad. And it got me super into social justice, as I uh, mentioned earlier. So um, yeah, that was a great experience. And she actually took us to two conferences where we got to present. So that was really awesome. And she wrote one of my recommendation letters for grad school. So I think that having that mentorship and support was really important. And then also having my internship in Japan the summer before I was a senior at Davis was, um, was really big for me because before that, I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do with a psychology degree. I knew that I wanted to help others and support them, but I didn't really think about education at that point yet. So when I went to Japan and I was working with high school students, I realized that I really liked it more than I actually thought I would. Um, I loved connecting with the students and the families when I was there. So then in my senior year at Davis, I decided to take a education class, like an intro to education class. And then as part of that class, I did an internship at elementary school, working with elementary school students, um, 
which I feel like I, I really love working with students and not so much the elementary school age. So that was kind of what I found out through that. Um, but yeah, I'm really grateful that I, I was able to do the internship abroad because it really opened my eyes up to how like I could be in a support role, role within education and um, getting to work with students was something I really enjoyed. Yeah, I think um, similarly, um, my undergrad and graduate experiences really helped prepare me, although I don't know, I remember hearing and I agree that it's true, nothing can really prepare you for the job until like you're there. Exactly. There are like, I don't know, just little things that um, that you like don't get a chance to do until like you're in the role where you're like the leader, you're not like um, under a supervisor or um, something like that. Although I do believe um, having a mentor is really helpful. Um, let me think, so in, so in undergrad, I was part of two different organizations, uh, one called Active Minds, which talked about uh, raising awareness for mental health issues and trying to like reduce the stigma around those. Um, I was also a counselor in um, Pearson Pride, which is for LGBTQ students, um, like a mentorship program. So both of those were really good experiences for me. Um, I feel like I was able to kind of like practice conducting myself professionally and also like making connections to other people was like really helpful. Um, so I really enjoyed both of those. And um, I was able to connect with some people um, through there. And then in my graduate experience, um, I don't know, the different courses that I took, I feel like really helped like shape what you know through like taking these courses I like see the type of teacher I want to be and like um I don't know different studies that we read about like helped me to shape kind of like my identity as a teacher um and I also think getting to do um student teaching <laughs> was very helpful and getting to see like what is um what is a teacher who's been in the career for a bit longer? Like, what is their perspective? And also reflecting within myself, like, okay, this is the way they're teaching. Is that the way that I wanna do it when I leave my classroom? Um, so then I definitely felt prepared when I started to like, like I said, kind of like forming my identity as a teacher and bringing that with me um, was definitely really helpful. Oh, and then um, for me, I just wanted to add that in grad school, some of the things that helped me was, um, I still remember one of the first classes I took in EDCO, which was all on different counseling techniques and like how to build rapport with the client or the student. And I still like use a lot of those skills today um, when I'm in doing counseling sessions with students or families. Um, so I remember we would do like mock counseling sessions with in peers or in pairs, I mean, and then in groups. And we also talked about some pretty deep things. Um, and so I feel like that class still stuck with me, like those skills of like active listening and pausing and, you know, all those really important skills when you're, when you're working directly with students or families that I still use today. And then one of my first classes in ECHO also introduced me to mindfulness because we read a book on mindfulness and that's after that class, I, I wanted to get more into like mindfulness and meditation. So um, I've been practicing yoga and mindfulness ever since that class for the last like four years. And it's still something that I like use. I even use it with students. Um, you know, I've taught a workshop with students at earlier this year um, on mindfulness and meditation, how they can use it as a coping skill. So it's just like a lot of things still are very like helpful with my career now and like with just my own self-care and also with um, supporting students and families. And then I would say that the internships were like super beneficial for me when I was in grad school. So I did three internships. And so um, I had a really awesome professor who was my fieldwork supervisor for I, two or three, I don't, I think two out of the three. And so she was great because she actually 
um, was went to my internship and she has, she actually like shadowed when I was in a counseling session with one on one with a student doing like academic counseling and she gave me feedback and then there was another time she came out and was there and um, gave me feedback at, when I was doing group counseling with a group of students running an academic support group. So then she gave me like super detailed feedback, which was like, you know, it was really awesome to get that and to improve my counseling practice. Um, so I would say the internships also were great with helping me realize like, oh, I really love like middle school and high school. And like, that's something I could see myself doing either one after, you know, graduating from the program. And then, so, um, yeah, I would say like internships and then, you know, a lot of the things I took away from the classes really helped me like professionally. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, I think that it's really special how you guys got to challenge yourselves and develop really strong experiences that you carried into your profession right now. And I love how you mentioned how the classes prepared you um, in order for you to develop your professional like um, ideals, goals, etc. So really exciting. Thank you for sharing. And I see we have um, a question in the chat. So Jocelyn's asking, what made you choose getting your master's at San Jose State over other programs, probably in other universities? Oh, I would say I can go first. I would say for me, um, I really liked how, you know, for me, it was like location was huge. And I did like how the program was in the evening so that it would allow me to be able to do internships or work during the day. And then all the classes are after four or four or later. So that was like a, a huge draw for me. And then just like, you know, location as well. Um, since my family's here and since like I'm from the Bay Area, that was also a draw to go to San Jose State. Um, and I had worked at, for some different organizations before grad school. So, um, you know, I kind of knew that I wanted to stay within this area for the program as well. And I knew that the program did have like connections with like schools and organizations. Um, the fieldwork program is strong. And so that was really, um, you know, a draw for me too, is being able to, you know, know that there's a lot of different school districts around here and that they're connected to, to get experience in. Yeah, so, um... I think, well, as I mentioned, I went to San Jose State for my undergrad. I really enjoyed the program there. And I thought, you know, it would be a great continuation. And I think it really was. Um, like, I feel like I could make connections from like my undergrad experience. And um, I don't know, I guess a bit of consistency. Um, in addition, like I'm from the area, I knew I wanted to teach in the area. And, you know, that's where I was able to do my um, student teaching. Although I didn't student teach in the district where I'm currently teaching. Um, I think being able to teach a, uh, a similar, similar population of students that you're going to plan to be working with is really important in getting to know and understand, I guess, like I mentioned, the population of students that you're going to be working with. Um, yeah, and I'm really glad with my decision. So that's how it turned out. <laughs> that's awesome. Thank you for sharing. Um, yeah, I can. Totally agree with your point, um, Lily, about trying to be prepared for the population that you work for, right? And I'm sure that you guys um, who are in Chad right now will already kind of be familiar with the idea of like serving different populations from various socioeconomic status and ethnicities and experiences, just a wide range of experiences. Um, and it's definitely very valuable to have that insight with you. All right. Um, I think we have time for That's another fine, couple cool. questions. Um, if anyone wants to drop something in the chat, I will be checking. But for now, um, let me just see if I can bring up another couple of questions that I'd have for you guys. Um, I actually, oh, I have a question. So my question was, um, what counseling program did she do at San Jose State? Because I believe there's different programs for counseling. Yeah, I did the counselor education program. And it's within the um, the College of Education. So it's a master's. Well, it's a master's in education with a concentration in counseling. And then I also did the PPS credential, um, which allows me to be a school counselor in California. 
perfect. I was just talking to a different, um, I think she works for, um, in that same field too at San Jose State. And she was telling me about that program yesterday. And I'm like, mm, I'm interested. I was actually thinking of doing criminology just to work with um, youth at risk. But then when she was telling me about counseling, I'm like, yeah, that one's pretty interesting too. <laughs> and how many units did you do? It was a lot. <laughs> I think I ended up with like 75 <laughs> altogether. So it was two and a half years. Oh, and I wow, was full time. <laughs> yeah. I was full time the whole time. So um yeah. <laughs> Cause the, the PPS adds extra classes in addition to the masters. Um, and then you do have to do 800 hours for the credential. I think they may have upped it to a thousand now. So um yeah, it was a lot of units. <laughs> and then my last question is, um, a master's is required for counseling, correct? Like to be a middle school or high school counselor? Yeah, for a public school, you need to have um, your credential, your PPS credential for public schools. So you can only get the credential with the master's and then you do the, the hours. Um, so for public school, K through 12, yes. And I know for my district, they want you to have the master's and the credential. Um, I work for Eastside Union High School District, and I believe a lot of the other local public, high, public K through 12 districts are the exact same way. Not private and charter may be a little different. They may be a little bit more flexible and may not require a master's um, and credential. Thank you. I also have a question. Hello? Yeah, sure. Um, so I was wondering, um, so with um, a bachelor's degree in um, Chad, what can you do, like, if I wanted to get a job, like, at a middle school or, like, a high school, um, like, is, there, is, is that possible without a master's? I don't know about that many positions that would be available without, you know, that would be open to without masters. Um, maybe working in the office, um, doing more of like administrative support or as like a kind of secretary support um, or being like a registrar. I don't believe that requires a master's. I think for like the most part, the teaching and counseling will require that. Yeah, the one thing that came into my mind is like with long term subbing or any type of substitute teaching, um, like if someone gets pregnant and, you know, that might be like they'll leave for half of the year so you can take up that position. Um, I believe you need just your CBEST and maybe a TB test, something like that. Um, but you would register through a specific district that you want to work for. But I definitely recommend substituting for anyone who's maybe a little bit hesitant. That's so what I did for a little while. It was, it's kind of like a crash course in um, learning about teaching, but uh, yeah, that's one thing that I do know. Um, so that also goes back, even if you, um, even if you chose path a B, like even if you chose community focus, you can still substitute. Yeah. So a lot of people can substitute. Actually, I know they were in my district asking recently since we're coming back in person, and not everyone um, dependent on like health factors may not be able to go back. So um, I, I'm not even sure if you need a bachelor's, you may just need an AA and passing the CBEST and certain requirements. So that's definitely something that I might look into, but yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, those are wonderful questions. I'm just gonna add another one that I see in the chat here from Shreya. It's asking, um, where would you suggest to look for internships? And maybe if you can share a little bit about your experience in interning at the um, undergrad or graduate level would be great. Yeah, sure. Um, for me, like I found out through about internships through like joining clubs on campus. Um, that was how I found out about the one abroad in Japan. And then that was also how I became a research assistant. And while I didn't get paid for that position, I did get units when I was a research assistant. 
Um, and then the other internship at the school was um, for the both of that. I, all the internships I've done at schools were when I was like um, in classes that required that, whether it was grad school or undergrad. Um, I would say something you can do, which is what I, I did with a few places was um, informational interviews. And so um, you can reach out to different organizations or people on like LinkedIn or something, maybe like different organizations that you're interested in learning more about or working for and um, ask if they will be open to doing an informational interview just so that you can kind of learn more about um, you know, the organization, what kind of skills they look for. And then sometimes those, um, you know, those informational interviews can lead to, you know, a job lead or them reaching out to you later on if there's something that's open, if they don't have anything open immediately. So I would say definitely utilize the networking. Um, and I think LinkedIn is really great for that. Yeah, I think for myself, um, I know both for undergrad and my um, graduate school, um, we know we're, uh, I'm not sure, I'm trying to remember actually. Um, I think in graduate school, you're placed in a specific placement. In undergrad, you have to find a local um, elementary school, but both of those are kind of like connected through the program. Um, outside of those student teaching experiences, um, which I feel like were really valuable for me, um, I got just jobs having somewhat to do with teaching. Um, like I said, I worked at summer schools, I worked at Galileo, I worked at the Tech Museum, and I feel like just those different jobs, like, they all do have to do with teaching and working with students, and I feel like those were kind of also a valuable asset for me when I was going into interviews, like having this knowledge about, like, different types of education, um, I think is definitely really helpful. Um, and also adds, I don't know, like to your own knowledge, not just like a helpful for interviews, but I think is helpful for me and like my mindset of teaching. So, yeah. Oh, and I was just gonna add that like San Jose State has really great job fairs. So definitely take advantage of those. They're like huge with so many employers present. So yeah, definitely take advantage of any of those types of opportunities. Thank you. I think that's really helpful feedback. And I actually really appreciate too that most of it isn't, how can I put this, not COVID friendly, right? Because the old format used to be like, oh, we'd, you know, reach out to someone or maybe shadow them in person or get connected somehow in a way that wouldn't really happen over the internet, but resources like LinkedIn and um, job fairs, which are still taking place virtually and um, being placed through the university are all things that I think we can still work with even in this kind of pandemic setting and as we transition. All right, so I see another couple of questions. I think they're both for Lily um, asking about what was your subbing experience like and which districts did you sub at? So both my student teaching experiences were in Oak Grove School District, and that's where I did my subbing as well. Um, since I had already had to get, um, I'd already registered for subbing because there were some days where my CT was out and I would lead the class. Um, my subbing experiences, like I said, they're kind of like a crash course. Um, I don't know. You don't really know what you're getting into. Sometimes you'll have like uh, really laid out organized plans and sometimes it'll be kind of more like you have to not come up with things they'll usually have things for you to do but I guess structure wise you have to kind of like set that structure um, I did the district that I subbed for was K through eighth and I did all grades or at least I tried to even though I I realized and I don't think middle school is for me but uh <laughs> I don't know maybe just substituting is, is a whole lot different um but it's just interesting, like I would like look at the different classrooms and I would think like, because um, every classroom is different. I'm like, what type of posters, what types of things do they have on the wall? What are their routines? And I just try to like absorb as much as I could. And um, yeah, through those experiences, like I said, it was cut a bit short, but um, you get to pick which days you wanna work, which is really cool. And maybe there's even half days you can work um, and you get paid per day or half day. So um, it was definitely an interesting experience. Yeah, thank you for sharing more about that. Um, 
something else that I do know about subbing is usually um, teachers will have to leave the lesson plans ready for you. So it's not necessarily such a overwhelming commitment, like you have to come up with your own lesson plans or anything, um, but it's still excellent exposure. And like Lily said, paying attention to the routines and to some other, you know, little details like posters on the wall, it's probably going to be helpful as you visualize the way that you want to approach your own classroom and your own teaching styles. Did we have any other questions from the audience? Okay. Um, so this is one more question that I had, um, and to me, it's just very like personally um, important to me, and I feel like it's something we can all kind of discuss and hopefully take note from. Um, and I can see that you guys share this value of diversity and cultural competency. Um, my question is, what values related to diversity and cultural competency are practiced in your work setting, and what can upcoming undergraduates do to advocate for equity in the workplace? Um, I would say that for me, like in my role as a school counselor, we use kind of like a multi-tiered system of support where it's like we have like universal supports where we provide to like the whole school community. But then like after that, it's kind of like a, a triangle or pyramid. After that, you know, you'd start in the middle tier, then you have more of like the um, check-in meetings or like group counseling for students who need that extra support, who are struggling. And then at the very top, you have the students, the small smallest group of students that have the most needs where you will refer out to, um, you know, specialists or community agencies. And so I think for me is like figuring out different systems within that where I can still like help and advocate for all the students and all their needs and use data so that I'm like, we're as a team, we're capturing every student and the different level of the needs. Um, and so we run reports and data all the time. And then we have targeted interventions for those different groups. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of different things we do. Um, we like we do have the, the big group presentations um, like group counseling that we do like with, um, you know, every couple months or every month with, with grade levels. But then we also do make sure that we are advocating for the students that most need it um, and, you know, referring them out so that they can get what they need. So I would say in that way, really, um, the advocacy piece is through developing those systems um, and making sure we are advocating for everyone and giving them what they need and being equitable. Yeah, I was like nodding along because I feel like all those things are talked about on the teaching level as well, um, or at least personally at my school, like the those um, multiple tiers of support, um, especially in this year, we were like, uh, you know, questioning like which students needs aren't being met through this format, like starting to question those types of things um, and wondering how we can best support students. Um, similar to what Nicole was saying, like having data on your students and really getting to know them, like you know them personally and you have that connection with them and their family, but then you also have like different assessments that you've done. So you know their abilities and um, you know, when you feel like you need to advocate for them or try to give them some other um, uh, form of support that you're able to do that. Um, I think that kind of like that mindset for me, it was pushed a lot through like my master's program and, you know, questioning like equity in school um, and being very conscious of that, I think has been really helpful for me. Um, that's something that I feel like I, I carry with me like day to day, like wondering like how I can meet the needs of my students and how I can, you know, the ways, I guess also the ways in which you speak to them, like those things are a bit more subtle, but I feel like I do carry like consciously thinking about like, or even like a book, like what types of messages are these sending? Um, being, I guess, very intentional with the way that you teach and talk to your students. Um, those are ways that that's cultivated. And um, I just wanted that for me that also, um, that advocacy and being equitable, equitable, I feel like is possible through collaboration. 
So like collaborating a lot with different departments on campus, teachers, parents, families, um, community organizations, our school social worker, we, I collaborate, our whole team collaborates with a lot. Um, and our school psychologists, because um, when it comes to, you know, certain students that may be struggling and like failing a lot of classes, um, a lot of times, like I do reach out to the teachers to get feedback. And then, you know, we have our 504 meetings and IST meetings, and we have, we bring the parent in. We also work with the school psychologist and school social worker. So we can like also identify like, okay, is this student struggling because they things going on outside of school um, and do they need like social emotional support or is it like academic um, maybe they have an undiagnosed learning disability um, and they need they need different classes and they need to be in special education you know so it's like a lot of that as well it's like the collaboration helps to identify the you know what's going on with the students and to see kind of like the big picture so I would say that the collaboration is is huge too, as part of a my job as a school counselor and working in a school community. Yeah, thank you both for sharing about your experience. Um, I know that multi-tiered systems of support is definitely a model that's frequently used um, among different schools. But the initiative to get those conversations started, to collect the data, to you know reach out to different team members, and to consider. Um, what materials you're sharing and the message that they carry are all just so important and so useful. Um, so I think we're gonna do one last question um, for the day. We're just gonna ask you, what are some final pieces of advice for undergrads that are considering their next steps now? I would say keep an open mind for sure. Um, Cause I, you know, I feel like I didn't know I wanted to go into education. I was just like, I want to be a psychologist um, or a therapist. And then, you know, going abroad and like having that experience working specifically with high school students really opened my eyes up to like, wow, like education would be uh, is something I'm considering now. And wow, I really like working with students specifically. So I say keep an open mind and try as many things as you can. Um, and then similarly, when I started EDCO or the grad program, you know, I was like, maybe I'll do higher, maybe I'll do um, middle school, maybe I'll do high school. I didn't really know, but then I just like tried different things, you know. Um, I actually worked for a little bit at San Jose State. Um, and then at the same time, I was like, you know what, why don't I just try the, um, the PPS credential because, you know, I, I liked working with high school students in the past. And then um, I tried a middle school internship actually. And so, you know, while I was working at San Jose State part-time, I was also trying out middle school. And then I ended up really liking middle school, which surprised me a lot. Um, and I was like, oh, wow, like counseling at the middle school level is really fun. Um, and then from there, I was like, I'm gonna definitely get the PPS credential. So definitely keep an open mind and try as many new things as you can. And the hands-on experience is really valuable for like seeing firsthand, is this like a good fit for me or not? Yeah, I agree. I know it's been difficult getting that experience this past year, you know, like the hands-on experience, I guess. Although I feel like I use a lot of the skills that I do in the classroom online. It just looks a little bit different. So not to invalidate those experiences at all. Um, but yeah, I think like what I tried to do is like I mentioned, like go in different jobs that are like connected to education or connected to working with students and also being, um, I guess, like the lead because that's like one big thing in like, I, at least like traditional classroom, right? Like the teacher is the one who's going to be like maybe making the lesson plans and also like leading the classroom. And I needed to see like, am I comfortable with doing this? Um, and do I have the skills to like manage a class and um, I guess communicate with different people. And I feel like the, the jobs that I had definitely like reinforced, like sometimes it's scary, but like I can do it. And I have this like experience to back me up. So I definitely, that definitely helped me feel a lot more comfortable entering um, I guess, life after undergrad. 
Thank you. I feel like I agree with um, all the advice that you guys shared of like keeping an open mind and just trying to explore new experiences that can help you gain insight. Um, it's just such a transformative time to be able to work with students, um, even now during the pandemic, across all age levels and to realize the impact that you can have on a child's mind and on their on their life and their outlook. It's really special. Um, so I think it's definitely a noble profession that we're all pursuing here to be able to work with kids in education and hopefully transform some lives. Um, but yes, thank you so much for joining us today, everybody. and. Um, for our panelists for coming. I know Janine has some final announcements to make. Yeah, I wanna thank um, Nicole and Lily so much for taking the time. I know you both have been at work all day and you know now to log back into Zoom um, uh, for this, we really appreciate you, you sharing your experiences and your words of wisdom and advice um, to our students that are here today and our students that are, are gonna be watching later. So. Um, and it's always very special and fun for me to see former students, um, you know, even though it's virtual to still have you kind of in the room, it's, it's such a, a joy to be able to see um, the fruition of, you know, all of your hard work and to see you out there doing the thing. Um, it's awesome. It's really exciting. And um, before we all hop off, I just, I do want to make sure that, um, take a look at what's coming up this month. So we have um, several other alumni events taking place. Um, we have uh, next week, next Wednesday, another alumni panel. We have a, a Chad a grad who is now pursuing child life specialists. Um, we have a, a graduate from our SLP program. Um, and then the following week, we have a special ed uh, credential alumna who um, is currently teaching and also a high school uh, science teacher joining us. And then May, we're going to round things out with a very special CDNS alumni roundtable. So lots of really great events. Um, please uh, register through Sport and Connect. You can scan the QR code to get linked there. And then some fun things. We know that these last few weeks of the semester are pretty heavy. Um, it's kind of just this downhill sprint to finals and we wanna make sure that everybody's taking care of themselves. So our peer advisors here in the Student Success Center have a couple of events that they've planned. One is an aromatherapy social. So we're gonna be making aromatherapy Play-Doh together online um, and exploring some of those essential oils and um, how that can benefit us. And then we're also going to do a paint night. So we're going to do a watercolor paint night um, on Thursday, April 22nd. And this QR code can take you to the registration form for both of those events. So we hope that folks will join us, take a little bit of time out for themselves and to kind of rejuvenate you know, for that final push of the semester. And then lastly, we just really want to make sure that you stay connected with us. So our contact information is here, our email, um, our social media handle, and our brand new website that was just launched today um, is there. We just, we thank you all for joining us here on Zoom. Um, those of you that are watching on YouTube, and then of course, our, our panelists and my co-host. Thanks so much for joining us today.